Thank you guys for coming back to the Salem Center Causal Inference Seminar. We have our third speaker with us today. His name is Jared Fisher. He's from BYU. Uh, Jared is a great friend. Uh, we've worked on a lot of projects together. I'm very, very happy that he's here uh, giving this cool talk to us. So, um, Jared, take it away. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So the title of my talk is A Bayesian Semi-Parametric Approach to Treatment Effect Variation with Non-Compliance. Uh, in other words, we're using Bayesian machine learning to establish treatment effects, but in circumstances uh, where we people don't comply with the assigned treatment, or where we can't, uh, or ethically won't, force people into the treatment. So the question uh, to start by posing is, um, what effect does health insurance actually have on your physical health? like a larger population level. Right, the, the challenge here, as I, point, as I was alluding to earlier, is uh, we're not gonna randomly assign people to you get health insurance, if you do not, we'll just see what happens. Uh, we don't do that. <laughs> um, but we also can't just take an observational study where we you know, just look at the effects of, you know, are people with health insurance healthier than people without health insurance? Uh, there's many confounding variables there, right? The reasons people do or do not have health insurance probably affect the very same health that we're trying to measure. Uh, so we can't do explicitly either one of these like we may have in other cases. Okay? Uh, and to do this, we have an uh, interesting data set that comes from the state of Oregon. In 2008, they expanded their Medicaid offer. And they expanded in an interesting way. They effectively uh, got the next 90,000 people waiting in line for Medicaid, and you know, like the next bracket up had about 90,000 people in it. And they randomly selected 30,000 of those to be able to apply for Medicaid, right, or to to enroll. They already applied; they could then get enrolled. Um, so now we have a form of randomization. Randomization is good in many ways because we can uh, try to find these out effects. The challenge is just because you were invited, it doesn't mean you necessarily enrolled. Okay? This is the non compliance. And please feel free to raise your hands, ask me anything. It was not really an AMA, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, but as we said, we're not going to randomly assign people to be insured, but we can randomly assign them to be invited to become the insured. Right? So those who are randomly invited. Many of them enroll, we call them compliant, and many of them do not enroll. I don't know if that's quite visible in the back, it says NC or not compliant, right? Likewise, for those that were not invited, uh, many of whom did not enroll, and some still managed to enroll. Some, right? Maybe their life circumstance changed and they now qualify for standard Medicaid as opposed to the expansion. Does that make sense? So we basically have four groups that we're interested in looking at, except these compliers and these compliers complied differently, right? These compliers uh, said yes when offered. They may have said yes when they may have found their way in without being offered, right? It, it could have been in this group had they been had a different random assignment. We don't know that. So that's something we'll look into. Uh, but looking into that, we need to realize that we have effectively two sources of variation. All right, as we'll say in a minute, we have two different potential outcomes. First, we have what you choose to do on your compliance status, whether or not you do the assigned treatment in this case, or the, in this case, not assigned, but invite treatment. And secondly, of course, there's that, the actual effects of insurance, right? So we have the impact on precipitation, not precip precipitation, participation, uh, as well as the effect of actually being insured. Cool. Yeah, those, those two things will both be looking for. Um, a, a typical way to approach this kind of problem is by just looking at the intention to treat, right? Effectively ignoring this layer and just looking at the effect of this group versus that group. They're randomly assigned. So you can look at the group that was randomly invited and see how their health outcomes differ from the group that was not randomly invited. Totally okay to do that. You know, a lot of noise in the process though, because not everyone who's invited actually that's Medicaid, right? Uh, so your estimates for these are going to have lots of noise and thus the effect size is pretty small. 
So instead, we're going to go through a route where we could guess who the compliers are and then compare just those who are compliers, right? Because the treatment effect for a true complier is the actual treatment effect that we're interested in. You have to be careful with the word treatment effect, but there's lots of different types of that as you'll probably encounter in the seminar series, right? Um, but we're going to try to figure out who the compliers are. That'll be our first stage is to try to model that process. Uh, and then once we know the compliers, we can really actually understand what the effects are. But when we look at the effects, are we interested in the overall effect? Sure. Are we interested in individual level effects? Yeah, right. There's quite possibly heterogeneity here, meaning the impact it has on me is different than the impact it has on David, it's different than the impact it has on Alec and the rest of you in the room, because we're all different. To give you a sneak peek, the first version, the IIT, ITT, the intention to treat, meaning we invited them, or this could be like a nudge in social science research, um, has an effect. This is non zero, right? You can see this distribution of effects, these are at the individual level, but they're kind of small. I'll talk about the scales and everything in due time. This is a sneak peek in case I see it. Um, but if we look at the same thing when accounting for the compliance structure, uh, we see that effect size multi, multiple folds large. Okay, how do we get to that? So in this talk, I'm going to hit on those two versions of variation, right? Those two sources of things that are going on, right? Uh, first is the variation in non-compliance, which is specific to the Medicaid problem. By the way, uh, in my slides, things written in black text are just general methodological pieces about what I call BCF late. Um, and things in gold text uh, are specific to the Medicaid problem. Okay. So in our Medicaid version is what kinds of people are more likely to comply with the invitation, right? More likely to sign up for Medicaid when they're offered to be there, when they're offered to join. The second, we we'll look at the variation in the impact of this intervention among compliers. In other words, for those who are complier type people, how does the Medicaid coverage affect their physical health? Any questions? Is that clear? Okay. So simultaneously solving two problems because solving one of them really helps us solve the other. And as we'll see, information about this layer can also give us better estimation of that layer. We're gonna do this with uh, BCF, so the Bayesian Causal Forest Method, uh, written by Richard Hahn, who was, I believe, the first speaker this semester, right? Uh, as well as Carlos Cavallo and Jeremy Murray. But we're adapting that to non-compliance. Okay. Uh, so I'm gonna go through some of the theoretical notation and things so we can understand the problem, um, as well as how to estimate certain, what, what, what do we exactly mean by treatment effects and how do we estimate those. And uh, then I'll talk, discuss the two layers of models and show the results. Okay. So the setup. Um, yes, these are maybe in gold. I was a postdoc at Berkeley. <laughs> so these are still Berkeley colors in my slide. Uh, so, <clears throat> Notation-wise, because any causal inference talk, you get all sorts of fun different alignments of notation, right? Uh, y would be the outcome, which in gold here is a measure of physical health. Right? Uh, Zi, I think, indicates the treatment, uh, the treatment assignment, that is, whether or not you won the lottery, the random lottery to join that kid. Di, D for drug, as if this was pharmaceutical, totally not, obviously. Uh, but that means you actually receive the treatment you ended up enrolling in Medicaid. Okay. Uh, and then XI, X is bold, it's a vector of covariates. Okay. Uh, we have 13 different covariates, including age, sex, income, race, household size, etc. Uh, and 4,849 subjects. Okay. Now you may ask, that's less than 3,000. Yes, it is. <laughs> Uh, we don't have complete data on all, or excuse me, 30,000, which is, we have 30,000 invitees out of 90,000. Uh, this is some of each of those groups here, for those of you who do have data. Okay. And we'll use this notation in the, in the potential outcomes framework, right? So standard potential outcome framework, we have Y when you don't get the treatment, so Y zero, and Y when you do get the treatment, okay? But we have two layers of 
treat, treatment now, right? One is being invited or assigned to treatment, and the one is actually getting the treatment. So we'll denote this with Z, the invitation. Okay, so when you're assigned to treat, assigned to control and assigned to treatment. Likewise, you have effectively a second potential outcome, which is your behavior or what you do when you're invited to treatment or invited, not invited to treatment. So D sub Z or D sub I of zero would be Medicaid if you're not, whether or not you're in Medicaid if you're not invited. And D1 is if you're in Medicaid, you are invited. So these are my things. Maybe I don't need to say it in this seminar series, but one of the issues, the main issue we encounter is the fact that we only know I have one of these possible two situations and one of these possible two situations, right? Everyone here, if we were randomly assigned, we only get z equal one or z equal zero. You can't get both. It's not two realities. There's no multiverse here yet, at least. Um, we only get one pair of these, and that's all. Oh, we only get one pair of these, and that's what we got to figure out. We're gonna have to make some assumptions and inferences and things to try to understand what might happen in another scenario. And I'll go through those in just a moment. The first set of assumptions we make is, uh, I should have started this off by saying this is a joint work I'm doing with Jerry Murray, who's here, and I'll be a fellow at Berkeley. So I say we, uh, as we. Uh, the assumptions we make are one of SUPRA, which is needed to, gen generally needed to use the initial outcome implementation, like we are. Uh, we're also assuming strong vulnerability, uh, which is easily satisfied because the lottery is random. Everyone has a chance of being selected, uh, and the selection is just a weighted coin flip. So. There's no compounders of no compounders of that nature. Okay. Okay. Um, these could be debatable, but we feel fairly safe that Medicaid is reasonably the same when it, on paper when it's signed to people, um, and that me joining Medicaid doesn't necessarily impact you. That's perhaps more up for grabs. But. So I mentioned ITT. What exactly am I talking about? Um, it's the intention to treat meaning we don't look at whether or not you actually have the treatment. We just say you were assigned the treatment or not. Um, and the key is the expected difference between you with the treatment and you without the treatment, or whatever we're measuring on you in this case, your physical health. Okay. Uh, we could allow this to vary by covariates and have a conditional ITT. And this is exactly what BCF and other methods do, where we figure out, given your list of covariates, right, the X's applicable to David, we can plug them in this function and get an expected treatment value. Okay, that's the ITT. Because um, we're not looking at whether or not you actually had the treatment. So it's the intention to treat. But our main target is not whether or not you are randomly invited. We don't want to be effect of getting a letter in the mail. <laughs> we want the impact from being insured. We want to know if you know, you're included if you actually have insurance. Because uh, the effect of winning the lottery is not the same as being insured. If everyone was completely compliant, then they would be one and the same, because there would be no different recourse, right? If you were invited, you would have to Okay. How much of a non-compliance problem do we perhaps have? Well, we know if you're assigned the treatment, and we know if you receive the treatment, right, across the columns here. And we know that little, almost 1,900 of the subjects in our data set were not assigned to treatment and did not receive treatment. In other words, they were not invited to join Medicaid and they weren't on Medicaid. That's a follow-up. Uh, but we know that 400 people who were not invited to Medicaid were enrolled in Medicaid a year later. And likewise, we have 1,400 people who were invited to join and did not. Okay, so we have, these are not zero, therefore we have, oops, excuse me. These are not zero, therefore it's, we have non-compliance, okay? Uh, in fact, you know, these percentages to be zero and 100, the show that in percentage. Okay. Now what exactly do we have? What can we, what can we figure out about these people and their behavior? Well, we can define what we call compliance types, okay? Um, this isn't for me, this is standing in the literature. So far, most everything I've said is standing in the literature, right? Uh, we can define someone as an always taker, where they, when assigned to the control, they get the treatment. 
or assigned to the treatment, they get the treatment. They always take the treatment. Okay? Uh, in a pharmaceutical trial version, this can mean that they find some way to get their hands on the prescription anyway, or on the trial drug anyway. In this case, it means whether or not you were invited, you ended up enrolling in Medicaid. Okay. Uh, we have our compliers that we're, we're trying to identify, or they follow that treatment assignment, right? One goes to one, zero goes to zero. If we have compliers, perhaps we have the fires that would do the opposite of what I'm going to tell you. It's the two-year-old effect, right? Um, right? They don't get the treatment when invited, and they get the treatment when not invited. And lastly, we could have never takers, right? Someone who's just not going to do it. Uh, I'm going to denote these as A, C, D, and N by their first letter. So we effectively have four different compliance types, right? Four different possibilities, and we only get to see one, or we only get to see one of these, right? So if we knew both realities, put you in and out of the uh, something slashing behind me, um, in and out of the treatment group, right? Uh, we would know what you do, but we don't know that. So what we need to think of is what we actually see. So I know if you're, I know what your Z and what your D are, right? If you're assigned to treatment or assigned to control, and you receive the con control, you could be a never taker, or you could be a complier. Likewise, if you're assigned to control and you get the treatment, you could be an always taker or a defier. Right? We have effectively eight groups. By seeing your Z and your D, we can narrow it down to two, but that's still more than one. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so we're going to make some assumptions to simplify this picture. The first of which is what we call monotonicity, which is a fancy name for saying there's no defiers. And a defier in this case is someone who will not enroll in Medicaid if they're invited to apply, um, and will still get Medicaid if they were never invited. Doesn't seem reasonable to us, right? If you're if you're joining the study, you probably want insurance or you don't, like it, there's a defier type doesn't make sense to me. So we feel pretty reasonable that there's no defiers in the Medicaid study. This is a fairly standard assumption in a lot of work in this space. Um, and we call monotonicity because it means D at one is greater than or equal to D at zero for all the classes, for all the compliance types. So we take the defiers out. It means we now have two buckets that are identified. Right, if you're assigned a treatment, you don't take it, because we assume there's no defiers, we assume you're never taken. Right? Uh, likewise, if you're assigned to control and you get the treatment, we assume you're an always taker. What this is going to allow us to do is we can now understand the how the covariates are all working for those two groups. And based off how these covariates are working, perhaps we can infer what's going on here and thus tease out the component. But we can't quite do that yet because we still have six possible buckets here, right? We have the never takers. We have two possible categories of never taker, right? We have those that are invited to apply and those that aren't. And perhaps that invitation has some effect on the never takers. So we're going to assume it doesn't. Okay, so an exclusion restriction we'll make is that the randomization treatment assignment only affects, only affects the compliers' outcomes, right? Because they actually get the treatment. Effectively, that letter in the mail, we assume that has no effect on you unless you actually go get the treatment. <clears throat> so the always takers, never takers, we're assuming that their potential outcomes are the same regardless of the invitation. Right? We're thinking that these never takers and these never takers are the same category, as well as these always takers and these always takers. And that'll let us learn things about this group because it's identified and we can apply to that group. And if you're in this group and you don't match that never take a description, you must be compliant. Kind of cool? Not my idea. This is someone else's idea. We're going, we're, we're going down the road. Um, all right. So if we can find these compliers, then we don't need to measure just the intention to treat. We can find the intention to treat just for the compliers, which is the actual compliers treatment or the local average treatment effect. So it's local to compliers, right? Um, so if we average over everybody, so it's local to compliers and average over everybody, that's the local average treatment effect, or weight. Sometimes called the CACE, 
for the uh, compliant average causal effect. But our target is specifically the conditional local average treatment effect, or the late of X, where we can plug in covariates here and know for a subgroup or a person of interest what we expect their treatment effect to be. So for example, we can look at females who are over 50 Hispanic and have income twice about the twice that of the poverty level. Just throwing out an example. Okay. Any questions? How do we get there? How do we estimate this conditional rate? Well, like I said, we have four groups now, right? We started at eight, assumed the fires were gone, so we have six. <laughs> then we assumed that the always takers and the never takers don't change whether or not they're invited, so we're down to four. So we have four groups. Uh, and I'm Bayesian. <laughs> if you didn't catch that by the <laughs> number of times Bayesian's been in the talk already. Uh, so I'm going to model each group, or perhaps we could, let me say this, perhaps we can model each group. Uh, give them a parameter, right? So mu sub s z, s is for compliance strata or the compliance groups. We have three groups. Z is what helps us split the controlled and treated compliers into two pieces. So really, we just have four means and some error variants. Uh, we can put priors on all those and then say the difference between this group and this group is the weight, right? We can find the compliers with and without treatment. Compliers with the treatment and the person who was without, uh, that would give us the treatment effect. That's fine, uh, except we want the conditional weight. So we could take this instead of with mu, we could have x transpose beta. We could do a linear model. Okay? And in fact, this is what's in, uh, if you've ever looked at the causal inference book by Ruben and Imbens uh, and gone to the part of the back, like chapter 25 or 26, it talks about building. Uh, a model-based approach to the local average treatment effect estimation problem. It's this, <laughs> okay? Um, if you do this, then you have different betas for each of these four groups, and then you want to know the uh, treatment effect for the compliers. So you take the com treated compliers minus the untreated compliers. Uh, linear algebra real quick says that these are the coefficients effectively of beta sub weight, right? So we learn those coefficients, we can see the treatment effect and how it varies over different covariates. Uh, the challenge with this specific approach is our priors are on each of the betas, when the value we're really interested in is beta late, right? And if we want to use priors to regularize or to understand the prior distribution of beta late, it doesn't have its own prior. Its prior is a linear combination of two other priors. So let's just go ahead and parameterize on beta late itself. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite this a little bit, where we have x prime beta for each strata, for each compliance group. Uh, then I have an indicator if you're in the treated compliers group, and they get some extra parameters. Right? That's literally beta something for us. Um, so this beta now has, there's three different values of beta here, a, c, and n. Right? Um, beta late can have its own prior because it's its own variable. It's independent, not independent. Independent in the social context, not in the statistical context. <laughs> and we can see that if we do the same thing where we take the expectation of, the case of expectation of just the treated compliers minus that of the untreated compliers, well, of course, we just have whatever the difference was, which is still just x transpose beta, right? Transpose beta late. And I go through all this to show that this is the idea. I'm going to take this reparameterized version of the Rubin and Inman's model and make it nonlinear. Okay. Um, however, <laughs> that's all assumed that S was known, right? All right, to build this model, I had to know what your compliance type was, and we don't know those. Uh, we know that, well, we do know that if you're not a complier, right? If your treatment accepted is not equal to your treatment assigned, we know you're a never or an always taker, and that's fairly straightforward. Uh, but if you are if you comply, we don't know if you're actually a complier or you just happen to be an always taker who was assigned to treatment, right? <clears throat> or the example I just here, if you are, you don't, get the, you don't get the treatment because you weren't assigned to the treatment, you could be a complier or a never taker. So what we can do instead, as Ruben and Nimmons do, they set up a multinomial logistic model 
on compliance type. Right? Because as we said earlier, we can learn things about the never takers and the always takers. Right? We can figure out kind of what this gamma is, this coefficients gamma sub n and gamma sub a. And based on those two, right, we can tease out what the rest of it should be and get an idea of how to classify people into these three groups. Once we have an idea of how to classify them into groups, then we can also fit the outcome model right here. And to, together, it's a paired model structure. Um, we can actually have inference on this situation. Okay, and the beautiful thing about doing posterior draws from MCMC is we will understand the variability around this as it pertains to also the outcome model. We'll talk about that in our industry. Okay, sorry to chat. Howdy. Um, <laughs> all right. It's not clicking. So what do, what do I mean when I say this happens in MCMC? Well, we've got, this is the full model, right? We've got our outcome model here, where we've got uh, different X transpose betas for each compliance type. We've got an indicator for being a treated complier, as well as the additional covariate pieces that come from that. And errors, those are normally distributed. Uh, we have a multinomial logistic regression here, and then some priors on all of them. Right? So the MCMC proceeds forward as sampling some new values of the multinomial logistic regression coefficients. Based off of those, we can impute some value for the compliance type. Right? That's what multinomial logistic regression gives you. It's one of a handful of categories. Once we know S, we can draw new values of our betas from the outcome equation. And of course, draw new sigma squared. And then repeat, right? Beautiful thing with MCMC, we can estimate parameter values and their distributions from complicated models. David. Um, I'm just curious, I guess, how much variance there is of the multinomial stuff. I mean, is this, is this a pretty stable part of the process where, where you're able to you know, pretty accurately learn the types and then condition on those, or is, it, is there a lot of noise? Great question. Um, depends on the problem. Uh, it depends on the individual, right? So in this problem, we can nail down the exact percentage. Uh, we have a pretty good idea of many of the people in terms of their compliance category. Um, now, in the applied problem, we don't know exactly what that is, right? Um, the model just says, you know, there's a very high probability there in this category. Um, in simulation studies, which I don't have in the slides, uh, we, you can vary the amount of noise, which increases the challenge of the problem, and you know, so it's, it's somewhat dependent on the problem. Did, so, did you ever think of using like a fancy classification function instead of multinomial? Uh, nope. Yeah. Great question. Now, that, that's certainly a place this could you know, be improved. Uh, perhaps I mean, maybe this is the optimal classification model. I'm not sure. Um, one of the reasons we did pursue this method is. Uh, it's one of the certain, we want to use BART. Right? We're going to put a BART prior. That's the next step here is instead of doing linear models here, here, and here, we're going to do Bayesian non-parametric prior, so BART on those versions. And we do know how to do a multinomial BART. Yeah, got it. So that's, that's how this plugs in here, basically. Yeah. Uh, Jared Murray's, it's going to say recent paper, I guess, I'm two years old now. All right, so um, to that end, a couple of things that may be kind of strong in this linear model setup is well, one, linearity. I guess that's the second point, but you know everything here was a linear model structure, just you know within a hierarchy, right? Uh, and secondly, we just have a simple normal prior on the error terms. Um, so in our work, we're going to relax that linearity assumption by using BART priors instead. Uh, we're going to leave normality there. Uh, something that perhaps can be done in the future. To that end, we contribute the following to late estimation, right? Combining these two points, right? Uh, imputation, the data augmentation of the compliance types. There's some stuff going under the hood that we, we do to help that algorithmically. Um, and we do that because we are relaxing the linearity assumption. 
we can do some other things. It's not here. Uh, and lastly, in that uh, what's going to be the uh, Bayesian nonlinear model on the multinomial logistic regression, we've created a new little, uh, a slight modification of Mark that allows the trees to be the same across categories and they do draw different values. Uh, so effectively, the leaves of BART are vector value. That's, that's kind of fun. What is fun in this kind of new? All right, so here's the big picture of our model. So we're going to, well, it's, we're just taking, I'm taking all of this, and everything that's linear is now a function of x. Well, these are already functions of x, but we're going to explicitly write it as such. So we have y is equal to some function that's determined by your strata membership, your compliance type, plus an indicator of being a tree supplier, that's the same, times a parametric uh, function of the treatment effects, right, of the conditional local average shape effectively, and then a multinomial logistic regression that's got these nonlinear pieces, okay? Um, again, S indicates whether you're always taker, a complier, or never taker. In this case, this is always true for being assigned to the control. So I might I might slip up and call this like a control function. It's not probably the right term, but um, these are always the control cases because the only group that changes when treated is the compliers. So these are your treated compliers. And like before, if you see on this, I'll alternate between sampling the model components and sampling the, or excuse me, the outcome model components and sampling the compliance model components in which we can compute your compliance types, your compliance types. So in the literature though, this conditional lean estimation is uh, often done with two state lead squares or what would be termed an instrumental variable model or an IV regression. John, the IV regression is you have to predefine what subgroups you're interested in. Whereas the BART approach will let us, BART will explore that space and figure out what combinations of interactions and nonlinearities is good. Um, it's also subject to the weak instruments problem, meaning if your non compliance rate is quite high, you don't have many compliers. That's kind of like in econometrics when we talk about having a weak instrument, right? The indicator of the instrument in this case is your compliance type, or your compliance seeing or whether or not you comply. Um, and if there's not much of that, you just have a weak instrument problem. Um, there are methods to flexibly estimate the ITT and then correct for non-compliance. So kind of like a two, I don't want to say it's two stage, because that's what this is, but a, a two step process. So you could fit like a, a BCF approach in round one uh, and then try to do posterior corrections in step two. Um, Thing is those posterior those corrections or posterior summarization corrections in step two. Uh, that's called the first stage, like the first stage of the instrumental variables. Uh, and there's no variation in it, right? So by doing the way we're going to approach it, we can measure variation in compliance and in outcome. Uh, there's new stuff called double machine learning methods, where they you know effectively running two machine learning, right? So it's double, where they estimate compliance and outcome. Um, Still an active new area from the treatment perspective, but how you know, from the treatment perspective, how do you explore variation? That's something that comes very naturally in the Bayesian approach, uh, not so much in treatment. So I'm not saying this to be critical of the methods per se, but just to point out like that's new and developing too, not as many answers as we have with older methods. All right. Um, I've teased it before, why we're, that we're going to use BART, but let me describe that more directly now. Jennifer Hill's paper in 2011 pointed out that with Sutva and strong ignorability, which both assumptions we made, like on slide four, right? <laughs> Estimating the ITT is effectively choosing a response surface with the With, uh, with enough treatments, um, that will get you the ITT. You can estimate treatment effects that way. So in this paper, there's a single bark prior on both of these, and then you do it without, you know, with zero, I think there was, no, correct me if I'm wrong, probably the wrong audience, but 
but uh, the single mark with x and z is the covariance, and then toggle z on and off for different x choices, and that shows you treatment effect of different x choices. Uh, well, we can do this in other approaches as well, because what's really good at estimating complicated response surface? Machine learning methods, trees, nets, you name it. Um, in particular, we want, we, we're going to follow what Hill and Han have done on the belt and using BART or Bayesian additive regression trees for that function. And what are these? Well, um, you may be familiar with trees, but a 30 second overview is it's going to split and partition the X space and assign values to each of the partition segments. So the tree part looks like this, right? So I have a list of x's, and if x1 is less than some value, I go down this side, or if it's not less than some value, I go down the no side, if it is less than some value, I go down the yes side. But what that does in x space is it effectively draws a threshold, and I'm going to have one value on this side and one value on that side. It can split again, however. Now we're going to split on x3. And that's a like drawing a line in another dimension. So I'm going to draw straight lines effectively through X space and break things up into rectangles. And those rectangles will each have their own predicted value. Uh, pretty flexible in finding sections, but then the breaks are not always super smooth. And the great thing with BART or any forest method uh, is you average over a bunch of these, basically, or you sum up a bunch of these. Uh, and what that lets you do is you can have a little more flex bit more flexibility than just a straight partition in a single tree. And that's what we do. Uh, Bart, the original paper, um, uh, Chipman and uh, co-authors, says y equals the sum function plus error, and that function is a sum of these trees. And some of the and people have done you know, groups of trees before. But what we made this extra novel was that they have natural ways to shrink your means towards zero and to shrink the growth of the trees towards smaller trees. And that allows this not to overfit, which is a problem in some machine learning methods, right? Well, why, why do we want to shrink? Well, if you've ever used a lasso instead of an OLS, that's why we're shrinking, right? It's a form of regularization. It allows us not to overestimate things, to play it a little safer, and more often than not, playing it safer is better than overestimating. Okay. So I've done all this. Maybe you've heard of ECF before. This is what uh, one of the foundations of our papers. What ECF did is it took y equal to that new function, right? When you're under the control, not the treatment, your outcome is determined by this sum of trees. If you are treated on top of that sum of trees, you have the ITT, right? Treatment effect. Now, with, with compliance, the ITT is the actual treatment. So this is good to go. Uh, but to this, we're going to add that, or we add the non compliant piece. So we're back here in our model, right? So we have mu, just, just like in ECF, where they have mu plus, they call this tau in the paper, I believe. So tau of x times the treatment indicator. We have mu plus a doubly, important, doubly moving indicator for both complier and treatment times the effects we're interested in. Um, so we have bark priors on both of these nonlinear functions. I even and uh, perhaps a stronger bark prior on late because we want to make sure we get the treatment effects right. Um, and then we're assuming there's the, the additive treatment effects here are not as perhaps as strong as um, the effects from the control. And like I said, we one thing we've developed is it will allow a shared tree structure. So the trees will be the same across the three groups. But the, the, the splits in the trees, I should say, but the nodes can be different values. And this is another way of sharing strength, right? Uh, and it ensures that the variables you choose that are important for one group are important for another group. Though they don't necessarily have to be important because they could have all the same value for one group. For one group. But it's a uh, shared strength. That's, so that's outcome. We're also going to model the compliance type, as we said, with multinomial logistic regression. Uh, it's simply this, right? So we're going to have three, three marks, so to speak, uh, and use those to develop this ratio of one group to the other to the sum of the whole. Uh, again, we're going to have different leaves but the same splits in the tree. So here's the whole model. 
Any questions so far? Does that make sense? All right, so if you're not treated, you just hang out with just mu of x. If you are treated, you get to add this to that. And we're going to try to figure out in this multinomial model what group you're part of. So I, I emphasize this a couple times because it is a non trivial thing in this research you know, niche of causal inference to be able to say that the posterior of S. It's actually naturally conditional on the outcome y. Right? We're not estimating this as the first stage and the second stage separately. They're jointly estimated. And so something we learn from the outcome, well, clearly we need to learn the compliance model to have an idea of how to do the outcome model. Right? We don't know your compliance type. We can't even fit the outcome model. But if we're sharing information this way, we can certainly share information the other way. And that does happen via MCMC. Really cool. All right. Um, We've kind of said this before in the linear context, but we're doing the same thing. We update the multinomial model, update the BART process, uh, impute the compliance types, use those imputations to update the next step, and then update all the pieces from the outcome point. So perhaps the fun part, like what does this, what does this all mean for our Medicare study? So let's talk a little bit more detail about what I, I mentioned. I get back to the scale of things, and here's part of that. So about two years after the lottery, they surveyed a bunch of people in person, and they gathered what something called a physical component score, right? Something used in their niche of literature. Uh, it ranges from zero to 100. The U.S. mean is 50, right in the middle, right? Standard deviation is about 10. And you see, this is from our sample, not the population at large. Um, the mean is about 45, standard deviation is slightly over 10.5, um, so perhaps slightly less healthy than average our sample, right? We have, uh, I said we have a bunch of covariates. Specifically, we have two continuous covariates, age and income. The income is expressed as a percent of poverty level. So if you have an income of one, that means you make whatever the poverty level is for your size of household, the region, et cetera. Uh, if you have an income of two, it means you make double the poverty level, et cetera. I mean, a bunch of categories. Um, a lot of this comes based off of the application they send in. So some, some things is perhaps not often looked at as others that we do include. Uh, you provide a phone number. Maybe that's indicative of something about the person. Um, but we also think that you know you might take in more of right? a um, number of household members on your application, race and ethnicity, gender, whether or not you ask for English materials. Um, and of course, that ends up being highly correlated with race and ethnicity, uh, whether you signed up on the first day or not. Right? So some demographic information and some application information. Right? <clears throat> well, what do we see? Now, recall that this is on the scale from 0 to 100. The standard deviation is about 10. So here, when I say the effect size of ITP is around 1, that's a tenth of a standard deviation. Meaning, if you're invited, if you just get received the letter, the effect of receiving the letter is a one point bump in your physical component score. That's something. Uh, that's not the full picture because receiving the letter is not the same as getting insurance. But with local average treatment effects, right, using the general methodology to put it out, even without our stuff, you could pull out and say, oh, wait, it's actually closer to 4.3. All this is is taking that estimate and adjusting for compliance rate. It's a pretty cool math that proves this actually. Um, you do the same thing with 92 stage least squares regression. Get the same answer actually. It's good when math lines up, right? Um, ours is a little higher, perhaps because we're incorporating nonlinearities, but it's in the same ballpark, right? About half the standard deviation is the population level effect on compliers. That get invited to treat. Okay. But didn't I spend a lot of time talking about how we want to do this conditionally, right? On X. So if we look at this again, right, this is everyone's individual posterior mean for that ITT. You can see here it's uh, nicely centered up right about where we said the last one, right? At about 0.8, or around in that general vicinity, about just less than one. 
But adjusting for compliance, or non I guess probably should say adjusting for non compliance. Um, yes, right? Set it right, right around 5, 4, 4, 5, 4, 8. But notice both of these are multimodal. We have probably, I, I feel pretty safe saying we have two, at least two, if not three or four different groups of people represented in this distribution. Is that fair? Does that seem like a reasonable thing to say? So what we're going to do is we're going to look and see if we can break this into groups. By the way, if you approach the conditional late simply on a linear basis, um, you don't see the multimodality. You also are way higher than the actual value we know is the center. So sometimes it's great to be, sometimes linearity does wonderful things, both for simplicity of understanding and model fitting, and sometimes it throws you off. Um, I guess I should give a brief word of defense for them. I, this, I could put stronger regularization on the priors, and maybe it would tease itself out, but this is, um, they're not really big priors still. So. Uh, what are we going to do, though, to break this down? Right, this is the posterior distribution across individuals for their so each of their posterior means. When we do this, we can, we can break this down and look at it in different lights through posterior summarization. That was impressively loud. <laughs> <laughs> so what do I mean by posterior summarization? Turns out, uh, functions of posterior draws of valid posterior distributions, right? If I wanted to know, for some reason, the posterior of two times beta, I could take all my draws of beta and multiply them by two, and that's effectively draws from the posterior of two times beta. It's a very simple function, but just for example. So instead, I can do other more interesting functions and find out what their posteriors are. Uh, we've seen this with uh, Papers that are you know, a few years old now, right? Where they've got a simple linear model. You've heard of you know decoupling uh, trinkets and selection from Carlos, right? You can do this with um, splines or a generalized additive model. Also, paper from us here. Say us, I guess I'm not actually at UT. We're right here today. Um, <laughs> uh, also, we can look at subgroups with carts. So that's classification and regression trees, right? That's saying we're going to look at all the people and see what groups they kind of break into like this. So if I take just the ITP and look at a cart tree across covariates to see which covariates are indicative of breaks in that multimodal distribution right here, we might look at this and say, all right, I expect something near uh, almost 0.9, something almost 0.8, right? See what the center the centers of these modes I'm pointing out. Maybe something over here at um, 0.58 or so. That's actually almost exactly what the cart tree shows us. Right? If we try to break this into groups, it points out that we have a group down about 0.66, uh, a group about 0.8, a group about 0.9. That breaks it out both on age and whether I'm getting a kid or Hispanic. <clears throat> and we see slight differences in the bump between the groups. Um, these are on the means. You might ask, you know, what's the spread difference here? A little bit, right? They're a little bit different. Um, but again, this is all the ITP. The whole point of my talk has been to say we can do this conditionally for the late, right? Oh, that's the title's wrong. It's good to know. <laughs> I presented this a few times now, and that's never occurred to me or the audience. So we'll figure this out later. Um, and like I mentioned, you can fit this with GAM as well. I see that the ITT really doesn't see much effect for continuous variables. But if we fit spline and the continuous variables and see generally what patterns emerge, um, maybe a slight increase with age, but it's not close to significant, right? But that's all the ITT. This is a talk about me. So here's the late effects. Uh, this tree breaks down. Oh, let me Right about how cool it is that it lines up with the stuff we want. Okay, about six, about four and change, about four, about three. Okay. Um, three ish, four ish, almost six. So, not quite the exact same as where the lumps were in the chart, but largely we're trying to find maybe what those four ish groups are. Okay. Uh, let's see if we break on age. 
Something happens around right before you turn 40. Uh, maybe you're more or less willing to use Medicaid based off certain phases of life. <laughs> um, and based off of race, right? So we see that the largest increase is happens in this older white group, and the smallest increase is in the younger not white group. Now let's define what I mean by sizes of increase. Right? This is when you're a complier and you're assigned to treatment versus not assigned to treatment. What impact does that have on your health in receiving that treatment assignment or not? So we see that young non-white people who are invited to Medicaid, or who, excuse me, young non-white people who are compliers who receive a Medicaid invitation and have a 3.8 point bump in their physical component score. So, I mean, each of these are close to half a standard deviation, so they're not incredibly far apart. Um, and we see, oh, excuse me, uh, you can, these line up fairly closely with what two CHC squares would give you, even though they're, you know, this is not linear, and that's uh, individualized buckets that we have to pre-specify, so it's not something you could directly do first pass with two CHC squares. You'd have to have some inclination of the group side. Uh, but here's the post, this is what I was saying earlier. Um, these are a little bit different. You see that um, there's some overlap between them, but the older white group and the younger non-white group do appear to be fairly separated distributions. Okay. Now, this is not to say that being white causes something. That's not the causal statement, right? The causal statement is for this group, assignment to or the opportunity to have Medicaid causes this effect size. Okay. Uh, David and I were talking earlier, and you know, thinking back to Richard's talk, where uh, or actually it was just been David. Oh, David, David, <laughs> and I were talking about how um, Richard's talk. Um, you know, these are moderators, not necessarily the mechanisms, right? Uh, so we can look into these as a follow-up to that. Um, last but not least, last ish, I guess I still have two slides. Um, what if we did look at those the gamp pits like we did earlier? And we see again that uh, they're not super strong effects, but I would feel fairly comfortable saying that your age increases, you tend to get more benefit out of having Medicaid, which makes sense. People who are, you know, as we age, we typically have more medical problems, right? But income doesn't do much, right? Basically, no effect on income. One question I've been asked more than once, so there's a slide about it. <laughs> Uh, is the first stage, aka first stage meaning from the IV terminology, aka compliance from what we talked about, is that driving the effects you see? Is that driving your variation? And you can think about, for those maybe not familiar with this, if uh, you're more likely to follow what instructions you've been given, you're probably also going to have more of an impact when you follow those instructions, right? Does that kind of make sense? And so what we want to look for is to see if the variables that indicate compliance pointing the same direction, are the same variables and pointing in the same direction as the variables that indicate treatment effects in the direction of the And we don't see that, right? The most important variable for compliance is your income. Turns out if you make too much money, you don't get Medicaid, but they probably knew that when you this. Uh, white does show up, uh, but maybe not as a huge split, so you feel fairly comfortable saying these different different variables and there's not the same effects driving the first and second stage. We can see that as well if we look at the continuous ones and see that that increase in age is probably the less significant than it was. And income has a big effect on whether or not you sign up for Medicaid. Right? And presumably these are people who could qualify for Medicaid in the first place. That's not completely there because you see that there's you know, some outliers here that are really, I mean, there's a lot of legal semantics as to who can sign up what way. Uh, that's a pretty strong point there. Uh, last but not least, for content wise, before I reach my conclusions, uh, I'm not just drumming these up, right? We can look for. Um, I'm not finding heterogeneity. I, I would like to say that I'm not finding heterogeneity where there is none. Because I look at the same thing for mental health, uh, and it turns out. Uh, everyone's mental health has about a three-point bump when you have Medicaid. It's, it's reassuring to know that you have that uh, I don't know, safety net. Is the right word? Okay. 
So in conclusion, uh, we present a flexible model for estimating the effects of a randomized treatment on the compliers. And part of that, as I hope I've conveyed here, it's important to figure out, try to figure out who those compliers are. So to do that, we impute the complier type. And we can do that via NTMC, because we're approaching this as a Bayesian framework. Not only Bayesian, but a nonlinear Bayesian framework. We've relaxed linear assumption via BART. And we've got that added bump of uh, doing vector values in the trees, that the tree structure, not the leaf, not the means, but the breaks in the trees are the same across these categories. And for anyone interested, you know, first applied to this um, Medicaid expansion. We're also, David and I are actually working right now to apply this to uh, whether your participation in an employer wellness program, right? So if you know many employers have this, if you go and you run X number of miles in two months, you get some type of benefit. Um, how much does that help you? That's what we're looking at. Um, I thank you and um, I'm happy to take any questions you have. So the the ideas for implementing um, 
a BART version of multinomial logistic regression comes from a paper Jerry Murray wrote yeah. two, three years ago. Uh, to implement this here, yeah, we, we had to go and then derive the same conditionals for that and for BCF, condition on each other, uh, and then edit the BCF C++ code to include a multinomial logistic regression. Good morning. All right, let's thank Jerry again. Thanks for coming, everybody. Oh, we have